Good morning. Great to be here with you. Pastor Derek was very kind, overly kind, might I uh, just add. I have had the privilege of knowing he and his wife, Beth, for basically 20 years, right? That's, that's not easy to come by uh, these days. I have known Pastor Adrian and Wendy now for 15, 16 years. My wife and Wendy used to dance together um, and... Uh, I mean, they've got stories. I've got stories with Adrian. And yes, Derek and I also were on a hip hop dance team <laughs> back in the day, right? There was a little roll, a little pop and lock that might have happened, you know, here and there. You just might not. You may, Who knows what's going to happen this morning? It's going to be a little crazy. Um, guys, I mean it when I say it. it friends, don't, they don't come easily of that length and that magnitude. I'll also just say this, if pretty much all my problems and all my issues can really be tied back to being friends with these guys for 20 years. <laughs> I mean, I pretty much blame them for all of my stuff. That's, that's good leadership. That's in the Bible, right? <laughs> guys, uh, my name is Andy. I pastor our Every Nation Church just outside Atlanta in Kennesaw. I have been married um, for... 16 years. My wife's name is Amy. We have four kids, 12, 10, 8, and 6. And we added to our mix a pandemic puppy. Uh, if you are familiar, uh, puppy sales were through the roof this past year because everybody was home. And so we, I mean, why not? Let's add a puppy to the mix. And so that's our family. Uh, we've been in ministry now for about 20, almost 20 years. And God is good. He's faithful. And one of the things, in, you know, we laugh about relationships. Um, the truth of the matter is, relationships are tough. Relationships are hard. And whether it's people that you walked with for some time, whether it's people in a church, people at work, whether it's people in your home, people that you live with, that, you're, that you, you know, rent an apartment with, relationships are difficult. And you got to work through stuff. And that's why today I have the joy and privilege of getting to talk to you about anger. What makes you mad? What gets you angry? Let's get more specific. Who makes you angry? Don't say it out loud. Some of you are thinking of somebody right now. You're like, oh, this, well, this person. I grew up in the Midwest, um, was in the, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and, uh, you know, in, in the Midwest, everybody has a basement. When I lived in Florida for six years, nobody had a basement, and so this was like a shift for me. I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't get that. Well, growing up in my house, everybody has a basement, and in my house, growing up in the 80s, uh, I had the original Nintendo hooked up in the basement with the big wooden TV. You know what I'm talking about? If you're, if you're, if you're an 80s kid, you might uh, be able to relate to this, but like the kind of TV you had to, you know, you walked over to it and like cranked that dial to change the channel. That's what I grew up with. That's what the Nintendo was hooked up on. And on one such occasion, uh, as the eight-year-old Andy was playing that Nintendo, I was playing the greatest game, of all time. What was that game? So glad that you asked. The Legend of Zelda. Okay. Was The Legend of Zelda. Don't even try to fight me on this, people. You had a sword and shield. You had epic music. You're saving a princess. I mean, I was living for this. And I'm, I'm, as an eight-year-old, this is a hard game. We didn't have this cloud-based stuff where your progress gets saved. Come on. You had to, like, commit. And you would, you know, you, you would, like, leave the Nintendo on. And then you'd go eat dinner. And then you'd come back to it. And you prayed that that thing was still, you know, the red light was consistent. It wasn't starting to blink yet. You know? You, oh, oh, this was real. Well, my sister decided that she was going to teach me an, an object lesson in self-control because I got mad playing The Legend of Zelda. Threw my controller down. Is Nintendo going to treat me like this? So she walked over to that Nintendo and she just 
push that button. She didn't know. I mean, I had given blood, sweat, and tears for progress in this game. Eight-year-old Andy gave up a lot to progress through levels of Zelda, bombing walls, figuring out puzzles, secrets. She didn't know what I had sacrificed to get as far as I had gotten in this game. But she learned real quick when Andy came with a vengeance out of, I mean, the third, bad out of the third ring of hell coming after her to make her pay for what she had done. I was angry. You might even say I was enraged. <laughs> what makes you angry? We can laugh about it. We can joke about it. Obviously, that's kind of a humorous story. If you have a sibling in this room, you know what it's like to get angry. Some of you know, everybody here knows what it's like to be mad and angry with their mom or their dad or both. Moms and dads, you know what it is like to be angry with your kids. Oh, yes, you do. It doesn't matter how old they are. You know what it's like. It doesn't mean you don't love them, but you know anger, right? If you have a pulse here today, you know the challenge of relationships. Some of you, are, you have roommates, and you know what it is like to be so mad at a roommate. You know anger. And then the truth is, forget people for just a second. Because the truth of the matter is, we can laugh about these funny situations but anger marks us in ways a lot of times we don't even realize. Some of you have been through some pretty tough things. You've been through some hard seasons and hard moments, and deep down you've done a great job at learning how to get through it and to, and to live and to cope and to just make do. And nobody would on the surface interact with you and think you've got anger deep down in your heart, but the reality is they're, they're still just some pent up stuff that hasn't really been dealt with. You got some hurts, you got some pains, you got brokenness there, and you've got to deal with it because anger, it shapes your heart, it shapes your relationships with each other, and it shapes your relationship with God so much of the time in ways you don't even realize. You get the squeeze, and, and, and that anger comes out in ways you didn't even anticipate, and it leaks out into other relationships. That's what anger does. Anger never stays put. It never stays put. It never stays where you, where, where you want it to be. It leaks, and it leaks out. We're in a series here at Engage called Return of the Throne, and, and, and this idea of kingdom living as we look at anger and as we look at revenge and the emotions that live in your heart, there is a kingdom way to live and there is another kingdom, right? The, the kingdom of just self, the kingdom of the flesh, the kingdom of I'm going to do this my way. And Jesus instructs us by the power of the Holy Spirit to live a different way with different values, with different priorities, with a different worship. But for most of us, it doesn't make sense. There's a natural just flow. We call this the world, right? The, the rhythm of the world where the, the tide is just moving this way. And when it comes to anger, when it comes to revenge and your emotions, here are some very common things that just naturally the world embraces. And when I say world, I don't mean this like fabric of boogeyman type stuff where you need to somehow be scared about going outside and, you know, oh, the world. No, 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 no. <laughs> Simply that there is, there are two competing systems here. There is God's kingdom and there is everything else. And we will call that simply the world, the other world. Okay. This is mine for the taking. So take it. You hurt me, 
So now I'm going to hurt you. You don't do that to me. Who do you think you are? I don't think so. There's grasping, clamoring, seizing, dominating. Do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. As long as you're happy. As long as you're happy. Or my personal favorite, just follow your heart. Which has worked out for approximately zero people. (laughs) Ever. In the history of the world. Highly emotive. See, the other kingdom, the other kingdom allows emotions to live in the driver's seat. And I want to be very clear. We need emotions. God has given you emotions. You need to feel those emotions. I'm going to be preaching about that literally tomorrow night, Monday. But, but for now, understand this, that while emotions are a gift from God, they cannot be the thing that drive you. They can't sit in the driver's seat. And when they do, destruction follows. When we talk about anger, when we talk about revenge, what we're really after here is, is it's transactional. Now, I grew up in a, in a uh, financial home. My dad was a financial planner. And so I heard about, you know, finances and money and all these things, and that's what I graduated with as a degree. I didn't plan on going into ministry. I thought I would manage people's money and all the fun stuff. But understand, when we talk about anger, what we're really getting at here is that someone has taken something from you and therefore you feel as if they owe you. And what you then in turn do out of anger is you do what you can to make them pay. And so we use use words like you owe me an apology. You owe me. An apology, as in you took something from me and now you need to give it back. It's transactional. We say things like like pay back. You're going, you you won't say this to somebody, but in your mind you think I'm gonna make them pay. And so I'm gonna walk around my house, my room, I'm not even gonna talk to my roommate. That's how I'm gonna make them pay. I'm gonna give them the cold shoulder, my spouse. I'm not even going to speak to them for a week. And I'm going to make them pay. Or you have thoughts in your mind. Come on. Where you, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to own this. But you wish ill will upon somebody. Well, you know you do. Where you just, you think, oh, I mean, I'm not, maybe I don't wish this upon them, but if something bad happened, I Wouldn't feel bad about it. And what you really are after is that the universe would right these wrongs and pay them back for what they did. Jesus has something very different to say to us. In Matthew 5, verse 38, he says, You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. This is Jesus. And the crowd would have been blown away at the the advice, the wisdom, the commandment right here. This doesn't make any sense. This is crazy town. This isn't how people live. Frankly, it's no different 2,000 years later. Nobody's teaching you to live this way. That's not what we do. Somebody hurts you, you hurt them back. Matthew 5, verse 43, Jesus continues this. He says, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and it sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? 
And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is laying it out here. And yet if you grew up going to church, it's easy to read this and just kind of happy-go-lucky it and gloss over it. And it doesn't really seem like that big of a deal. I mean, after all, do you really have enemies? I mean, who would you define? That's a big word. Who is your enemy? That's like saying, who's your nemesis? Who? I mean, you start thinking like Marvel movies. Like, who's Thanos in your life? Sorry, I don't really have a Thanos, you know? Like, that's not, I mean, I don't relate to that. So who's my enemy? In the same way that people came to Jesus and, and Jesus says, love your neighbor. And what did they say? Well, who's my neighbor? Well, who's your enemy? Because in the same way that your neighbor is expanded to the people around you, well, your enemy is expanded too. Who's your enemy? It's anybody who's hurt you. It's anybody who you feel has taken from you. See, people, people take. They take peace of mind. Some of you feel robbed of dignity, robbed of respect, robbed of honor. Some of you know what it's like to live in a home where you felt like mom and dad favored a, another sibling, and you feel robbed of what loving parents should have given you. You feel taken. What do we do with this? Because Jesus says to love those who've hurt you. Paul says something similar. He says, get rid of all bitterness. In Ephesians chapter 4, rage and anger, get rid of it. Brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Get rid of it. That's easy. You've got bitterness and rage and hurt and pain. And Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, just get rid of it. I read that and I'm thinking, my man needs perspective on my life because he does not know what I'm going through here. This isn't like I can just put it in a sack of tr trash and take it out to the curb like I'm emptying the trash on Monday morning. Get rid of it. Thank you, Paul. Your wisdom knows no bounds. And yet... If we're not careful, we forget that Paul is writing this letter from prison. He's chained up, shackled up. Here he is writing to the church. He's been beaten. He's been left for dead. He's literally been without clothes. He's been starving. He's been shipwrecked. He's been going blind. He's been abandoned. He's been rejected. He's been every single thing that you can possibly imagine if there's anybody who's got a little bit of room to be mad about something. Is it not Paul? Get rid of this, he says. You don't want this. Don't play with this. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I'm not saying that it's easy, but I'm telling you it's worth it. In the rest of that verse, he writes, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. In the same way that Jesus has forgiven you. And what is it that he did? What is it that you, we sing about? He paid your debt. He paid the debt that you owe. In other words, he canceled the payment that was required because of your sin. Do you know what the word forgiveness literally means? It means to cancel payment. It's a financial term. It's transactional. So when we sing about the debt that we owe, when we sing about forgiveness, what we're really talking about is a debt that you cannot possibly pay, a, a debt that you cannot possibly repay. There's nothing you can possibly do, and yet Jesus stands in this gap for you, and he says, I'll pay this. In fact, you can cancel what they owe. I'm paying it for them. 
That's what Jesus has done for you and for me. And now we, in turn, get to offer the same forgiveness to one another. It's not easy, but oh, is it worth it? For the sake of your own heart, if nothing else, it's worth being free to cancel the payment. When I got to my hotel last night, <clears throat> um, I have four kids and now a puppy, and it's never quiet in my house, ever. And so watching a movie is, I mean, I watch like 10 minutes a day if I want to watch a movie. It's like, well, I got through scene two. We'll pick up next week, you know, for the next 10-minute installment of this movie. <laughs> Movies don't really happen in my house a whole lot right now. And so I got to the hotel. It's quiet. I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to watch a movie. <laughs> yes. And I'm scrolling through, and you know who I see? I see Liam Neeson movies. And I thought to myself, getting ready for this message, I was like, Liam Neeson has really built his entire career about being angry and getting revenge because of something that happened to him where something was taken from him. Literally, the movie's called Taken. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to watch this. This sounds awesome. I've seen it. But when it comes to anger, of all the emotions, anger is probably the fastest to destroy relationships, and it's also the one we are most willing to live with for such a long amount of time. We, we, we're almost braggadocious at times about anger, are we not? As if, as if it's like, you know, how you felt and how you raged and how you treated that person in a moment of tension. Like, the, the, the bigger and badder you were in that moment, the better. In Star Wars, total nerd moment, Empire Strikes Back. What is it that the emperor, he says, he says, I, I feel your anger. It gives you strength. <laughs> gives you focus. Right? Oh, gosh. But that's how we feel. I'm ho holding on to this because it gives me a little something extra in my back pocket. It focuses me. I need this. It defines who you are. But what you don't realize is that it is making you bleed out in all of your relationships. It's not giving you strength. It's hurting you. And it's time to let it go. I'm not saying it's easy. But I'm telling you, you need. For the sake of Christ in your heart, for the sake of your relationships, for the sake of your parenting, for the sake of your roommates, for the sake of siblings and families and future generations, for the sake of what's to come, you've got to get to a place where we get and you get rid and I get rid of all this stuff that's causing anger in my heart. This past year's been full of it, hasn't it? Oh, you got a list of people on social media to be angry with. You don't even know them. <laughs> you don't even know them, but you literally don't even know them, but there's something stirred up inside you. Knotted up, tense, anxious, angry. So what do we do? Well, forgive, if forgiveness is the, is the, you know, it's the decision to cancel a debt. The cure for an angry heart then is obviously therefore forgiveness. But what do we actually do? Because Peter comes to Jesus in Matthew 18. He says, he says, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Seven times. Don't you love Peter? Peter thinks he's like rocking this right now. He's like, oh, you guys, check this out. I'm going to blow Jesus' mind. <laughs> Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Up to seven. As if like this is amazing work <laughs> being done here. And Jesus is like, okay, time out. Let's tap the brakes. And he, in verse 22, he says, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he wasn't able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. Be, be patient. Catch the agony. 10,000 bags of gold. This guy couldn't have paid this back in 10,000 lifetimes. Servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins, which is not a very large amount of money. He grabbed him and began to choke him. He says, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me, and I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And they went and told their master every single thing that had happened. The master called the servant in. He says, you wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. In other words, the magnitude of our sin is so great. It's like 10,000 bags of gold that you will never be able to repay. And yet your master, your Heavenly Father, in mercy, canceled that debt. And yet we have so many times, in turn, been that person who, in turn, refuses to extend grace and forgiveness to those who've wronged us. And many times, and I'm making light of it, many times it is small things, might I add. I'm not making light. Some of you are carrying things that are heavy and hard and they are difficult. And I'm going to give you some hope at the end of this. Cultivating a habit of forgiveness in your life and in your heart. I'll share a story. It's different than the one I shared in the first service. I got lots of opportunities to share and kind of open up to you about things that I've done wrong or, or moments where I've been hurt or pained or things have been difficult. And when I pastored in Orlando, there was a scenario, a situation where, where one of my best friends who was on staff with me had a moment of moral failure. When I say moment, I mean three years of deception and lying. And it was on staff at our church and, and it was the kind of thing that it could have literally destroyed the whole church. It was, it was one of those things. Not only was it, was it hurtful because it was on staff and it was in our church, but it was my friend. One of my best friends. And I was so mad and I was so hurt over it I had to sit down and fire my friend. And I was driving around in downtown Orlando, and out of my mouth, I said, God, if you want to just take this dude out with a bus right now, I wouldn't be that upset. Did I really mean that? No. But did I feel it in that moment? Yeah did. I'm a pastor. That's not very pastoral. That's not very kingdom. God, if you want to take this dude out with a bus, be my guest. And I rounded the corner and I was hit by a bus. Totaled my car. Took the whole front end of it off. It was one of those situations where you pry yourself out of the car, not sure how you're not scratched. 
I stood there in downtown Orlando. I was reminded of this. I literally looked up at heaven and looked up at the skies. I said, God, I get it. I get it. It's okay to be angry in this moment at my, at my friend. But I'm not going to hold on to this and hold this over him. Far be it from me to be the kind of person who forgets what you, God, have done for me and be unwilling to then extend it to somebody else. I'm not saying that this gets a free pass. I'm not saying that this is okay. I'm not saying that I can't be upset still or even angry still or somehow that we need to be best friends again. But God, what I'm going to do moving forward is I'm certainly not going to condemn. I'm certainly not going to speak this way. I'm not going to think this way. God, You have forgiven the magnitude of my sin. The 10,000 bags of gold, you wiped that slate clean. God, help me to do the same. Whether it's somebody that you work with, whether it's somebody on social media, how many things have boiled up right now politically, race-based, vaccination-based, where you've just been angry and you want to fight somebody or you're walking away in your mind thinking a certain thing, thinking something over somebody, wishing something for somebody, and this isn't the way to live. This is not God's kingdom. There is a better way, and that way is the road of forgiveness. A habit of forgiveness. God, I cancel the debt. I feel like this person owes me. I feel like my mom or dad owe me. I feel like my brother or sister owe me. I feel like my roommate owes me. I cancel this debt. I will not require payment any longer. See, there's a propensity for us all to forget what Jesus has done for us. I want you to hear this today, church. Most people think of forgiveness in terms of what has been done to them. But God asks you to forgive in terms of what's been done for you. He's given you everything through Jesus. And today you get to do the same. 